or a satellite tower or what, but it was one of those tall things, real big. Not a, not a power, it was something else besides power. But anyway, it was a big, big, tall tower. And on the top of that tower was about two or three or four dozen buzzards. And I said to Gail, they ought to name this place Buzzard Roost. You know what? Some churches should have the name Buzzard Roost on them. And that's a sad commentary against some churches. Is that right? You know what the psalmist says in Psalm 35, 19? Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me, neither let them work with me, wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. David had those that hated him. And we know that as we read the Bible. David had people that hated him. And we, we think nothing about it because we say, well, that's David, he's the king, etc. And he did this and he did that. We know the life of David. And we say, yeah, we know David had people that hated him. People that cursed him. But we also know that Jesus had people that hated him. Didn't he? Didn't Jesus have people that hated him? So here you have two of the main characters of the Bible, David and Jesus, and people hated them. And that's kind of unusual, isn't it? Don't you think that maybe people that are living for God are going to be hated? If David was hated, if Jesus was hated, don't you think somebody's got strong convictions are going to be hated? Yeah. Going to be hated, There's no doubt about it. Then there are some people that actually hate preachers. Can I tell you something? So there's something fundamentally wrong with a person who says they are a believer and they hate preachers. There's something fundamentally wrong with them. And I don't know what it is. You say, well, they got hurt by this preacher or that preacher or something. By the... And let me tell you something. I don't care how many times we've been hurt by preachers or something else has happened to us. Can I tell you something? Be careful that when you hate people, especially hating a preacher. I think that's a sad commentary on a Christian life. Go all the way through the Christian life and let it be written on my tombstone. I hate preacher so-and-so. That'd be a sad epitaph to put on a uh, tombstone. And so the last statement of verse 12 said that they may be found even as we. Uh, it'll cut off the occasion for them to accuse and they will have to live honestly before the church as well. It is clear that the false teachers claim to be teaching and preaching without asking for support, while in reality they receive special gifts from the people from time to time. Now, I've told you this before, but I'll tell it to some that haven't heard it. I worked for a fellow at a &P, and he was a preacher at a small church in Lawrence, and I was working at a &P as a stalker and uh, all the rest that goes with it and a general tormentor of people that live behind the a and and I won't tell you who they were. And so anyway, so while I was working there, they said, we've got to have a produce manager. Produce manager had to go somewhere, and we had to get another one. So they hired this produce manager, and he was a preacher of a small church. And uh, I noticed as uh, I would be working around uh, stocking and doing whatever, that I noticed that his church members would come in. And so here's this little old lady and little old man. They come tottering into the A&P store and they, and they go around to the produce department. They finally get there. It's the first, first line you come to. And they get there and they look up at their preacher and they say, Preacher, what's this Sunday for? And I didn't know what they was talking about, but I was listening. I, I, hate, I hate to say it, but I was paying attention to what was going on. And the fellow was kind of big and had a kind of a big mouth like and a big laugh. And he laughed real big and he said, this is corn Sunday. And they said, okay. And I looked around and they went over to the fresh corn and they got some corn up. And they were going to take that fresh corn to church Sunday. And they'd come in the next week and they'd totter around there. And they'd say, well, what's this Sunday, preacher? And he'd say, today's green bean Sunday. And they'd go over to the green beans and get a couple pounds of green beans. And by the time, uh, finally, he, he had to resign, uh, not resign, but he left the church for some reason, I don't know. But anyway, the bank came and repossessed his car. Now, can I tell you something? There's something wrong with that picture. There's something wrong with that picture. You say, well, preacher, I wouldn't be like that. Now, I don't want to be that way either, for sure. There's no doubt about it. But can I tell you something? Paul is saying, I'll live above reproach. I've got strong convictions. I'm not going to live like these false prophets are. I'm not going to live that way. 
I've got some strong convictions and I'm going to stick to it. And if I stick to it, they can't say anything about me and they will actually end up having to conform to the way I believe because of the church is going to expect it. They can keep up their charade, but they probably can't. By the way, can I tell you something? You can't keep up a charade forever. Eventually, the curtain's going to come down on that charade. Somebody say amen. Eventually, that charade is going to be open and above board. <clears throat> so, I resolve then. Here's another statement. We resolve not to be a moocher. We resolve not to look at the mistakes of others. But here's another one. I resolve to be the best example I can be. Amen. How many of you believe that? I resolve to be the best example I can be. Now, I know maybe the army has some kind of saying or somebody else has some kind of saying, but can I tell you one thing? Paul said, I'm going to be the best example that I can be, and they won't have a leg to stand on. Can I tell you something? Every believer in here ought to say, I'm going to be above reproach in everything I do. What, it doesn't matter. what. By the way, man sees the outward. God sees the inward. So man is only going to see what comes from the outward. And so you got to be careful about the outward because that's what man looks at. Amen. But I'll promise you this. You can't put on a charade about the outward if something's not right on the inside. Amen. So the inside needs to be right and the outside will have to be right as well. So I resolve not to be a moocher. I resolve not to look at the mistakes of others. And I resolve to be the best example that I can be. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. These apostles who are not real are very deceitful. Now think about that. Here they are in the church and they're deceitful. Now you can almost see what the next resolve is, but I'll let you just kind of think about what it's going to be. But I'm talking about the false of pro uh, prophets here were deceitful. They managed this charade or show with something called deceit. Here's one thing that we can be assured of. This is one thing you can put down and we used to say in your black book. You can put this one down. Deceit is not of the Lord. Deceit is never of the Lord. If you, if you are trying to deceive, by the way, I think deceit is just a sneaky way to lie. And so sneaky lying and deceit is not of the Lord, it's of the devil. Albert Barnes says this, and sometimes I read things to you, but I think it's good. I want you to get the point of this. Here's the point. It is possible that they were people who saw that great advantage might be taken of the new religion, talking about the false prophets, who saw the power which it had over the people and who saw the confidence which the new converts were inclined to repose in their teachings, perhaps people who had seen the disciples to the Christian faith commit all their property to the hands of the apostles, or had heard of their doing it. And who supposed that by pretending to be apostles also, they might come in for a share of this confidence and avail themselves of this disposition to commit their property to their spiritual guides. To succeed, it was needful as far as possible to undermine the influence of the true apostles and take their place in the confidence of the people. Let me just stop there right there. And that's all I got for Albert Barnes. You see, Paul had the confidence of the people, and they were trying to destroy the confidence of the people. I want to tell you something right now. When people have confidence in a godly leader, it is ungodly to try to take that confidence away. You say, well, I really want the confidence that they have. But wait just a minute. That godly leader may have spent his life serving those people. And then somebody comes in and wants to kind of sneak around behind them and get the confidence of the people. That's not right. I've seen that happen over and over and over again. It's a sad tale. By the way, those that tried to sneak and grab the confidence of the people, they ended up on the outs. They never did end up right. Never did. Anyway, I don't have time to tell you those stories. So these people... Uh, had an opportunity, they saw an opportunity to cash in on the confidence of the people and maybe even, just think about this, remember in the book of Acts they were turning over their property to the apostles and Barnes mentioned that. Just think a minute, if you were a real estate agent 
and you were into real estate and then you had quote gotten saved but you took the not only the salvation of Christ but you also took the all the law and went with it tried to mix the law and salvation and then you saw people turning over their prop, property to the apostles that real estate agent's antennas would go Bing. I think I could get some property for nothing here can I, I can almost see that you say preacher do you think they really just wanted yes they just wanted the benefits of the apostleship they really didn't want to do the work of an apostle amen amen so think about that just a minute so they transformed themselves into the apostles of Christ but they had a completely different motive their motive was not to get the gospel to the lost their gospel was not to win the lost and to see believers edified. Their motive was to be uh, enhanced by it or to be um, get more from it, get more for themselves. They transformed themselves as apostles. Now, I want to talk about the word transformed. I just said it said transformed themselves as the apostles of Christ. I want to talk about the word transformed in that verse 13. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. When we get to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, it's the word metamorphosis. Where we get to the word metamorphosis, it's metamorphe, I think. And in that, Romans 12, 2, that means a change, a completely different change for the good. And it's not talking about some other kind of change, but it's a change that is better. You can see the metamorphosis of the butterfly. It's better. And so that word change has a, a good idea about it. And it means simply to change. But this word transforming in this passage of Scripture is not metamorphe. It's another word that means to change by disguise. It means like to put on a mask. I don't know about you folks, but there have been a whole lot of times when I think people put on a mask. They're not real. They're not genuine. They're just putting up a front. This is the way I want you to think I am. By the way, what you think people think about you is not who you are. You get that down. What you think about yourself is not who you are. What you are in Christ is who you are. Now you think about that a little while. You, you let those things sink in. That is really some good old-fashioned philosophy. What people think about you is not who you are. What you think about yourself is not who you are. But what you are in Christ is who you are. You got to remember that. Well, this transform means to put on a mask. These false teachers were putting on the mask of an apostle. And so the Bible says in the last days there will be those that call themselves Christ. Matthew 24, 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. Matthew 24, 24, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive, there's that word deceive again, the very elect. Do you know before Christ comes again there are going to be people doing all kinds of signs and wonders? I can almost see it over here at one of these charismatic churches. Woo! And everybody flocking to that place. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed, there it is again, into an angel of light. So they were transforming themselves, putting on a mask as the apostle. And so Satan is doing the same exact thing. This is an, a tactic of Satan. Satan transforms himself, puts on a mask as an angel of light. And the ones who are deceivers, the false prophets in the church, at Corinth there, they were putting on a mask, just like Satan, doing the same thing. Can I tell you something? Putting on a false front is of Satan. It's not of God. Got to think about that a little while. Let us not be deceived. Let us not be false. Let us be real with godly motives. So here's my next resolve. I resolve to be real, not a deceiver. Here's a fact that you can count on. The deceiver's greatest convert listen to this did did you get it from a philosopher no i didn't get it from a philosopher i got it from just plain old watching people observing nature pastoring church churches the greatest convert of a deceived person is himself 
The greatest convert of a deceived person is his self. He or she deceives self first and foremost. Self-deceit is very destructive to personal satisfaction. Lying to self results in a warped personality and persona. Do you know I didn't know this? <clears throat> There's a lot of things I don't know. I found out I didn't know a lot of things when the Internet came along. All of a sudden, I didn't know nothing. The Internet's got so much knowledge there. But the Internet said this about the self-deceived person. It's got a name. It's a disease, they call it. You know what the disease of a self-deceived person is? It's deceptology. Deceptology. Here's a quote from their information on the web. Self-deception can have serious consequences, both for the individual and for those around them. I, I really want to hang on to that one a little bit. Can I tell you something? When we're wrong, it doesn't just affect us. It always affects somebody around us. We've got to remember that. If we're not real, then something happens to those around us. I always remember that. I resolve to be real, not a deceiver. So let me go on with this. <clears throat> it can lead to relationship problems. I want, I want you to know something. I want you to listen carefully. Everybody, how many of you listen to me right now? Everybody listen to me? When a person is always talking about relationship problems, guess what? They are deceived. When a person is always talking about relationship problems, they are deceived. Now you think about that. Deception always causes relationship problems because people see through it. And they know they're lying. And they know they're not telling the truth. It creates relationship problems. I didn't say it, they said it. But let me tell you something. I don't take the internet over the Bible any day. Do you? No, I don't. But this is just something that they found out. It presents relationship problems. It presents f financial problems and even mental health problems. Here's what else they said about deceptology. It makes one sick and also makes others who are involved sick. It makes one spend money unnecessarily on health issues. Overly concerned about health issues and spending a lot of money on it. <clears throat> It makes one mentally ill. Now, I just gave you that little short quote on deceptology for this reason. Paul says, I'm not going to be that way. I'm not going to deceive anybody. And these false prophets in the church at Corinth, he's telling the Corinthian people, I love you, I care for you, I'm going to shoot at gun barrel straight, I'm not changing my convictions. Don't be deceived. Don't let people deceive you. James 1.8, listen to this. This is deceptology in the Bible. James 1.8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Deceived person is double-minded. <clears throat> now let me give you another one from James, again, 4.8. You know, James must, <clears throat> James must have known about these Jews that were playing this game. <clears throat> James 4.8. Draw nigh to God. <clears throat> I like that. And he will draw nigh to you. I like that. And then it says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. I want you to listen to that verse. I want you to listen carefully to it. Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Isn't that amazing? Philosophers call this disease deceptology, and uh, some call it the ill of untruthfulness. The ill of untruthfulness. Lying is the opposite of telling the truth. A self lie will present a lie to others. It is a two edged sword. <clears throat> you know, the two edged sword is mentioned twice, several times in the Bible, sometimes negative content. Uh, context and sometimes in a positive context. <clears throat> the double-edged sword of the Word of God is the only thing that will do work on the double-edged deceived person. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
Here's what the Bible says when it talks about a two-edged sword. Proverbs 5, 4. This is the negative part. Talking about a bad woman, a harlot. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. So in talking about that harlot, the two-edged sword is used in a negative way. She appears to be smooth and attractive and kind and loving at first. But then the end of her is like death and hell. That's a two-edged sword. It goes in one way and it comes out another way. But the Bible is a two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I like that. You, you, I never noticed it said sharper than any two-edged sword. So there's a two-edged sword there of that harlot woman, and there's a two-edged sword of the deceived person, but the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword. Well, I like that. You know, I always thought it just talking about a two-edged sword. The Bible is sharper than a two-edged sword. It didn't say sharper than a two-edged sword. It says sharper than any two-edged sword. Any two-edged sword. So there must be a bunch of them. There must be a whole lot of two-edged swords out there that are negative. But the Bible is sharper than any of them. Piercing even to the divided and sundered soul and spirit and of the joints and merit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay, only the Word of God can effectively deal with the mental disease of deceptology. I want to say that plain and simple. Do you know what? All of us need to realize this. The Word of God does have the answer. And the Word of God has the answer to a person deceived. Amen? The Word of God has the answer to those that are deceived. The, here's what, if the diseased person or deceived person, deceased or deceitful, deceased, either one, will read the Word of God and ask, I mean this with all my heart, if that deceived person and diseased person would read the word of God and ask the Holy Spirit of God to help them, it would show them where they're right and cure them of that disease. It would absolutely do it. Now, we don't believe the Bible can do that. We think, well, that's just in the area of psychology. That's in the area of mental illness. That's in something else. And, and the Bible can't do it. Do you know, I believe the Bible can change people. And I believe if they just read the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to help them, that he would change them. I believe that. I wish that would happen over and over again, I wish. By the way, in the book of James, when it says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James is talking to people that have gone through manifold trials and troubles. And they are really... James said, be patient. You're going through all these trials and troubles, be patient. He said, you've got to believe in God. You can't just not believe in God. And here's what he says to that double-minded man. He said, now look, you've got to be patient. You've got to let patience have a perfect work. You're going through these severe trials. But I want you to remember this. Here's what he says to the double-minded man. Listen to what the Word of God says to the double-minded man. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. That deceived person needs to ask God for help, and God will help. Amen? In faith, not wavering one bit. Well, I have some more little things, but I'll just give you these last four and we'll stop. Number one, my first resolve was I resolved not to be a moocher. My second resolve was I was resolved not to look at the mistakes of others. My third resolve was I will be the I resolve to be the best example I can be. And my fourth resolve is I resolve to be real and not a deceiver. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. I pray that you'd help us all. Thank you for helping me not cough tonight. And I pray that the word of God will find a resting place in our hearts. May it not only find a resting place, but may it find that good soil where to take root and grow. And it will bring, bring forth fruit. Dear Lord, I pray that you would help the word of God to find suitable soil tonight in our hearts. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>